you doing? It's John Capista with the EXP Realty. Special guest today is Jake Handler, also with the EXP Realty. Jake, how you doing? Good. Thank you for having me, John. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I can't help but notice the David Cohn perfect game in the background. You're a I've Yankees a fan. Big Yankees fan. Quick trivia question for you, John. Putting you on the spot here. Yep. What current Yankee player was there in the attendance in 1999 as a kid? Uh, the only current Yankee player I can think of would be Aaron Judge. <laughs> I knew it's him. No, Anthony Rizzo. Oh, okay. Yeah, July 18th, 99. Yeah, I've been out of the baseball game for quite some time now. I see that. Yeah. yeah it's okay. Stick to real estate. You're good at that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> real estate, hockey, entertainment, and podcasts. Yeah. That's good. that's about it. And cool. technology. Yeah. That's um, right. So tell me a little bit about your real estate career. When did you start real estate? What made you want to get into real estate? Yeah. So actually, I started during COVID. Um, I, during, you know, during the shutdowns of 2020, it was actually on my birthday where everything shut down. I was sort of bored, kind of like the rest of the world, but I don't like being bored. I like learning and educating myself on new things. And real estate is something I always wanted to get into. And I felt like with COVID happening, you know, I, I turned, you know, lemon into lemonade. And I was like, this is my time to get my real estate license to you know educate myself more in investing that i've always wanted to do i actually had the time to do it i took the course and i went with it yeah i actually find well i found it pretty easy to get your real estate license um and i tell a lot of people that you know pretty much any state you and i are both in new jersey but any state you know you sign up for some classes you take 75 hours 100 hours whatever it might be pass the class, pass the state test, and you can have your real estate license. That's the easy part. That is the easy part. It is way easier than, I mean, if you wanted to become an attorney or a doctor, you have to go to eight years of medical school or law right. school. So yes, it's a lot different. However, I think this is where you're going with this. It becomes more difficult to be successful at so something that's such a low barrier to entry. Absolutely. Yes. Yep. And I, when I was educating myself in 2020, it was actually first as an investor, more so, you know, I, I always wanted to get my real estate license, but it was really to be an investor, which I still am, of course. And that's sort of my number one thing. And um, it was Bigger Pockets for me, the Bigger Pockets podcast during uh, the shutdowns of 2020, I would just listen on repeat nonstop. I actually went all the way back to episode one. And it's on like 800 now. And I literally, wow. literally listened to all of them. Um, you know, so I felt really comfortable getting my real estate license and going forward with that. So did you have any real estate investments before you got your license? No, I was, I wanted to be a really great baseball coach before I got my license. Um, that was sort of the route I was down uh, as a teacher and a coach. And I have experience coaching high school baseball and I was actually coaching baseball during the lockdowns. Well, up until the lockdown. So it was baseball season. And as soon as I realized that my uh, baseball knowledge can be translated into something more lucrative, like real estate, I was all in. I was like, oh, yeah. you know, rather than me seeing the launch angle and the exit velocity on this, you know, this prospect i can use that same math those same math skills and and analysis and projections into a four family that's awesome i love this game you know so that that's that i fell in love after that yeah yeah i've i've also noticed a lot of real estate agents that have come from all different backgrounds throughout life you know whether it's coaching and using mathematics in your coaching now using mathematics and science in your real estate investment in your real estate career. You know, myself coming from retail and a leadership role, you know, being able to teach and train and develop and, and try and lead people in the real estate field. You know, I'm finding that as long as someone is passionate about something or they were passionate about something, they can find a way to translate that into the real estate world. You know, you don't, just have to be a good people person, that helps. But if you're not a people person, there's still other avenues that you can go down in real estate. 
And I, I wish I heard you say that before 2020, because that was my, I, that was what's, what's holding me back. I was like, you know, I see these successful real estate agents, <clears throat> agents and, and investors. And in my head, I was like, but they have this and I don't, or they, they can do this and I can't. And I thought that I had to be a certain way. And I learned quickly that you should be yourself in real estate as a realtor. Uh, when you try to be some sort of other realtor for some other property that doesn't fit you and your needs and your way of kind of going, it's not going to work well for anyone. So th there's a lot of room to be yourself in real estate. And I did not understand that until I was in it. Yeah. Yeah. And you can, you can be very successful, you know, sticking to your niche, sticking to what you're comfortable with. Um, I do not think of myself as a people person, despite being told that I'm very good at public speaking and I don't mind throwing myself out there to the world quite often, but I don't like it. I don't enjoy it. So, you know, I didn't think that I could be successful or, or even get transactions done because yeah. I don't like talking on the phone. I'm never going to do door knocking. I'm not going to do cold calls, you know, just certain things that I, I thought you had to be great at to be good at real estate, but you can swing your business. You can swing your career really however you want. You can. And it's funny because I actually have sort of opposite skill sets to that. I, I think I am a people person. I like networking, meeting people and um, you know, just, I, I guess coaching is, is a leadership role where you have to be communicative a lot. And that that's sort of how I am. Uh, what I don't, what I thought was true at the time and what's not is, you know, if you notice me and you were wearing casual clothes and a, I'm wearing a backwards hat, you're wearing a, a hat, you, you can do that in real estate too. And, you know, I watched, maybe I watched too much Selling Sunset, but like I see what they're wearing and I'm like, this isn't me. I'm not a salesperson on the, on a billboard with a suit. That's just not me. Uh, yeah. so that was sort of a limiting belief there. Have you watched the new season of Selling Sunset? John, I watched that season before I like as soon as it dropped. Yeah, as soon as it dropped, like all oh, eight yeah. right away. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't make it past episode one and a half. I kind of got fed up with the new season. I mean, it's season six. Did you watch the first five? Yeah, I watched them all. Yeah, <laughs> one just hit different. <laughs> yeah, it just I don't know the cattiness, the drama. The it was just I like agree. the same. I Mm -hmm. nonsense it's there's a handful of new girls and a handful of the same girls and it's just we could do a whole episode maybe in the future about selling sunset but <laughs> well it's funny because i think so many people watch that show and want to become realtors and i watched that i mean i was already a realtor when i started watching that but now i watch this new season and i want to quit real estate for watching that yeah. <laughs> not actually but it's like the opposite of how i think real estate is and should be sort right. of so uh, I like it, to watch and try and catch any uh, real estate commission rules yeah. that they're breaking or advertising rules and regulations and things. Now, maybe California is different, but whatever. I, you know, are, I, yeah. I, I like to wear my real estate, my realtor hat when I'm watching that. Your real estate commission's hat? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Meg and I, my girlfriend, we actually took a cross-country trip to California last summer and we, and we drove to the office. So we, we checked it out. Oh, nice. Not inside, we can go in, but we did yeah. look through it. We, no one was there. Have you have you ever sent any leads or sent any emails to anyone at the Oppenheim Group? No, no, no referral partners there. Nothing. Okay. Oh, I did. <laughs> yeah. I sent my first listing that was over a million dollars. I sent it to Amanza at the Oppenheim Group. You know, what on Instagram? No, to her actual business email. Oh, wow. You can go on the Oppenheim Group website and find all the agents and their, their emails. Yeah. Now, whether or not they personally monitor their email accounts, you know, we see them on Netflix and we think that they're a celebrity. We don't really know what level of celebrity right. they are, right? So whether or not they're monitoring their email account or not. But, I mean, I got a multi-million dollar listing. I might as well tell as many people in the world as possible. Yeah. Uh, it's good marketing. It's you. You would be someone I want to use as my realtor for doing that. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. That's a good call. I mean, what are they going to do? Click unsubscribe. Tell me to go kick yeah. rocks, and I mean, who cares? They might be like, "Oh, Hillsborough, New Jersey. I never yeah. heard of that." You know. And and you bring up the hat and the t-shirt thing. You know, when I left my more corporate retail leadership job, I told myself that I'm never going to dress a certain way or act a certain way just to get clients. 
I'm, I'm never going to wear a suit unless I feel it's necessary. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to wear a shirt and tie unless mm -hmm. I think it's necessary. Like I'm very much t-shirt and jeans, hoodie, maybe a collared polo, maybe a collared shirt, but you know, this is who I am. Take it or leave it. Yep. Most of what I'm wearing I've had for like 15 years. So, <laughs> oh yeah. Yep. And this is my big night on a podcast too. And I still chose this out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you gotta be relaxed. You gotta be comfortable. You gotta be yourself. <laughs> yeah. You know, ultimately home buyers, home sellers and investors, they choose their real estate agent. But we as real estate agents, as independent contractors, we choose our clients also. Yep. So if somebody were to come to me and say, you know, hey, John, I'd, I'd much rather you have you wearing a suit when you take me on showings or, you know, how come you didn't wash your car every three days and I saw your car was dirty one time that you took me out to showings. Like if you're going to bring up something as trivial as that, like I don't know if I want to be your realtor. Well, I agree because it's a relationship. It, it has to work both ways for it to get to closing successfully. Yeah. And, and I know you, you agree with me on this because we've spoken about this, but like, it's so important. It's so relationship based, this, this business, you know, if, if you're, if anyone's having a bad time, it's, it's just not a good play for anyone, right? Like forever, you know, I, and, and I really pride myself on having clients and repeat clients and not losing old clients because I did such a good job with them uh, the first time. Yeah. Yep. And I've, I've actually let a few clients go or I've yep. recommended them to someone else just because, you know, either they weren't as responsive as I wanted them to be. They didn't answer text messages, phone calls, emails. I couldn't get, you know, truthful information. You know, I'm not going to take you as a buyer. I'm not going to take you to go see a $500,000 house when you tell me that you can afford 1500 a month or $2,000 a month. You know, unfortunately, in this market with property taxes and the cost of homes in our areas, you're not going to get a $500,000 home for $2,500 bucks, uh, unless you have a substantial down payment. But right. And, and, and I, like, I like the clients. So I speak in that fashion to clients where it's just the truth. And I like working with people who can handle that. Because again, that's how I am. That's how, uh, if, if they are, then we're going to be a good match. And we're just, mm -hmm. no, we, we come off as someone, we don't want to waste each other's time, both of us. Yeah. So let, let's be efficient here. When I, so when I started my retail management career, I was told that I was very much a yes man. So anytime someone above me asked me to do something or asked me for something or to work extra or work an extra day or whatever, yes, yes, yes. I'm finding in real estate, I'm not the yes man. You know, I will give you truthful, honest answers. Hey, John, do you think I can afford this house? Well, what does your pre-approval look like? Okay, it's too close to the ask price. And right now in the market that we're in, you, you want a pre-approval at or above what list price is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, hey, John, what do you think about this house? It's well below my budget and it's everything we're looking for. Well, no, because the septic system is falling apart or it's being sold as is and it has unpaid property taxes or unpaid sewer bill. But yep. you don't see that in the listing. You know, we can see that as realtors. Yeah, and it's a tough transition for me as a baseball coach. Like, you're just sort of trained or, uh, you know, your experience is sort of being a yes man, right? There's things that are so much out of my control as a coach, like the bus driver being late or rain. And like, you're, you kind of have to say yes to a lot of things. And so it, it, for me personally, it's, it was a tough transition when I was starting out to being, um, you know, more like, Hey, this is my time that you're not going to take advantage of. So I'm not yeah. a yes man all the time. Yeah. I think, you know, you build your confidence too with with anything whether it's sports whether it's business whether it's retail management management leadership in general and especially in the real estate world um you know just talking to clients for the first couple times you build confidence so hosting an open house which i think you just hosted another open house today didn't you hey i did yes yes i can't stand hosting open houses uh same <laughs> i just don't like it you know, I'm not, I'm, me too i'm not a fan I've done it for every one of my listings except for a couple that actually had offers within the first one to two days of listing. Yeah. So I didn't even hit that weekend. Um, 
I'm just not a big fan of it. Yeah, I think that it is for certain properties at certain times only. So this is um, so today's open house that I did actually wasn't for my listing. It was for someone else's listing. I saw it as a good opportunity for me. And I haven't done uh, an open house for another agent in probably two years. So um, I, I, I generally agree with you. Absolutely. Sometimes I think if you're putting four hours into an open house, well, what if we recorded four podcasts and came up with reels and shorts to put on our Instagrams during this? Right. Don't you think that's a better use of four hours of my time? More lead generation, more helping sellers and buyers? In my opinion, yes. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> And, and the open house market can always be hit or miss. I don't care how hot the, the real estate market is or how cold the real estate market is. I hosted open houses a year to a year and a half ago. So late 2021, spring, summer 2022, the height of the real estate market over the last couple of years. Zero people came to the open house for three hours. Zero. Wow. I've hosted open houses that had 40 plus people. So you just kind of never know. Yeah. And from an agent's perspective, you know, well, it depends if, if it depends if you're the listing agent or not, that, that sort of matters. But sometimes 40 people isn't, isn't what you want from the realtor's perspective. Cause it, no. it, at this point you're managing tra your, your traffic manager, traffic controller. That's sort of what you're doing. Right. You're not really interacting with people. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's going to be a little tougher to build a connection. With, exactly. the, with the prospective buyer. And they can barely get questions in that they might have. So it's right. just not, you know, you, somewhere in between is a nice one. Yeah. Yep. Um, so you talked a little bit and you mentioned a little bit about investing in real estate. Do you currently have any real estate investments? Yeah, I do. I, so I started investing. Well, I guess my first investment, we can call it, is my primary res was my primary residence. The first one I bought in 2020. Bought a condo in Morristown, New Jersey, which is a really great location. It's walkable to the town. It's where a lot of younger people want to be. It's a very growing area. Two bed, uh, two, uh, one and a half bath condo. And it needed some work. And when I, you know, again, I was just starting out in 2020 as both a realtor and investor and a bigger pockets listener. And I was hearing on bigger pockets that, you know, all this math, all these rules of thumbs uh, for in terms of math that are out there, like the 1% rule being one of them, where that that's trying to tell you that if, if you're buying a home, you should get 1% of the purchase price back in rent per month. Uh, I noticed, you know, throughout my search of looking for a home that there's just that doesn't exist in New Jersey. Um, I don't think it exists in most states, depending on the interest rates and the taxes and all that. But it is just a very, I told you, I started listening episode one. <laughs> so it's a pretty outdated um, rule of thumb. And, and I still think it's important to know about it and to sort of work off of it. But after seeing a lot of homes before I settled on the Morristown home, I realized that if I was solely relying on math to do, you know, to, to make my move, then uh, still in 2023, I would have zero homes. So I am a large, I, I'm a very big proponent of math and, uh, you know, science as well in, in terms of for, for real estate, but there's sometimes there's art involved too. So what I bought didn't look great on paper and three years later, it's the best decision I made. So at the time it was um, a place that needed some work. I told you about the location a little bit. And I actually house hacked it. So one of my one of my best friends lived in one of the other bedrooms. So it was, a, it was a two bedroom, one and a half bathroom. We ended up living there for two years together. And I uh, renovated it as time went on. Some things I'll I shouldn't have done, shouldn't have tried to do myself. And some things I you know I learned by doing that. And then I had to rehire someone else. But that was my tuition. And um, so I have that you uh, that condo still. Two years later, after buying it, I bought another home, um, and that's where I live now. <clears throat> and I kept the first condo as a rental, so that cash flows about six hundred dollars a month now. Which, again, at the time when I was buying it, didn't look like it was going to do that. But I sort of trusted the, you know, the the process, I guess, and the rent, the rents in the area went up. Uh, you know, and ju just a few things that I was able to do really got the rents up, made it a nice asset for myself. 
Um, and then the home I bought where I live now, I bought it as a three bed fixer upper. Having done the first um, experience with the condo, I was able to sort of understand what I'm good and what I'm not good at. So I hired most of the work to be done and I converted this three bedroom house into a four bedroom. Um, and I also rent a few of the bedrooms. So I'm house hacking still. And um, that's essentially where my buy and hold real estate journey has taken me in three years. Mm. I mean, it's still huge to actually have the balls to just do it. Like have the balls to jump into it and say, you know, not that you're going to buy something as a primary residence, but you're buying something as an investment. It can be your primary residence at the same time, but ultimately there's another purpose for it. Yep. I, I think it, not enough people think of real estate investing that way. They think they have to have tons of money and they need to have a landlord and someone that's going to watch over their property and do this and do that. Um, I think there's a big disconnect there amongst people who probably could afford to invest in real estate. We're not talking hotels. We're not talking motels and huge million dollar buildings here. You know, like you said, it could be a condo, a townhouse, yeah. a two bedroom, a one bedroom, something. <clears throat> Yeah, I just really that that my, my first condo experience and the fact that it does so well for me even today and probably for the next 50 years, honestly, is it just I am I love telling people about that story because I was not approved for a loan from two different lenders at the time. Third lender I spoke to approved me and I made the move and I put very little money down. That's just my strategy. I think if you can buy a home at for like 10, 20,000 out of pocket, sign up for that all day. I mean, I, maybe I'm risk adverse to debt, but I just think that that's, if you're a younger person and, and you see the, and you have the vision of how this, you know, this loan, this debt is going to play out for you positively over the years. I mean, you can buy, you know, everyone talks about how expensive homes are. I agree. But the fact that you can buy a home for 5% down, sometimes less, is just such a tool that people don't use a lot. If it, and, and you can only really do it if you're moving into the home as a primary residence. But for a younger person to be able to do that and rent out a bedroom in your home, so you're essentially living for a discount, everyone should be doing that. Every young person should be doing that. <clears throat> Yeah, it's huge. I mean, I bought, so I bought my house, Jesus, 16, 17, 18 years ago, something like that. I think I was 26, 25. Um, and now it's, you know, well more than halfway paid off with hundreds of thousands of dollars in equity. So now becomes the next year or two kind of becomes the plan. Well, you know, is it time to rent this property and go live somewhere else? Or is it time to sell this property and go move somewhere else? Or is it time to take equity out of this property and buy an investment property and still live here and wait a few more years until the investment builds equity and then do it again and again and again? You see right there, your three options that you have versus the three options that you'd have if you rented this whole life. <laughs> Your three options if you rented this whole life would be, should I, should I stay even though the rent is increasing? Should I move even though it's going to, I have to pay for a realtor, the, the, the commission to move and to pay another security deposit into a new rental with a high rent? Or should I buy a home, which I now can't afford because I rented for 20 years? Those would be your three options if you rented your whole life versus the three options you just shared that you owned your whole life. And it's just it's really important to have that vision. If it, you know, if, if you can have that vision, then you can sort of you know take some some lumps now and see, oh, this is a really tough down payment for me. But in twenty years, this is going to be the case. Yep. Yep. Yeah. When we when my wife and I bought this house, we pretty much oh, yeah. almost wiped ourselves out just to get the house because we knew the importance of. Yeah. Number one, having a house, but also long time home ownership and, you know, built up equity in the future. You know, even if the housing market goes down, your investment on a home still goes up over time. And you still have a house that you know is going to be there. 
Yeah. You know, you don't have to worry about the rent going up or someone else moving into it. Mm-hmm. And I just, I, I shared, I, I, my first condo, I was not approved for a loan, but the first two lenders I spoke to. So I found a third lender that worked for me. And then two years later, I'm buying another home. I mean, explain that you can't other than you got to trust the process. Right. Trust the process and trust the numbers and trust the math, but also be willing to take the risk. Yeah. And if, and if you've done the math and you've done the calculations, it becomes a calculated risk. Yeah. And, and again, art and vision is key here too. It's not all math because that's just, you're going to, you're going to do, you're going to have analysis paralysis, they call it, and just analyze forever. Because in math, you could say, well, what if the uh, the roof, you know, leaks in year four when it's supposed to leak in year 25? Like, I mean, you're, the math is going to kill you. So there's got to be some sort of jumping that you got to do. Right. What's, what's, uh, what's your future look like in real estate investing? What, what are your plans? <sighs> it's a great question. I, I definitely want to have more properties sooner than later. And, and it's funny, like, I feel like everyone has that answer, except people who have zero properties, because they don't know what it feels like. And that's why I urge everyone to get into it. Um, so yeah, it's sort of like a, a drug, you get addicted to, to buying homes once once it works out for you. Yeah. Uh, and so I definitely want more. I, I'm not, um, you know, I, I prefer the buy and hold method of just owning rental properties and having the equity do its thing for years and years and years. I am um, disciplined and patient and I can see, you know, see the vision more so than making a quick flip uh, in the next, you know, year or two. So my, my strategy is typically just buy and hold and try to have as many solid doors as I can. Right. Nice. Nice. If you could go back a couple years and do something different, either in real estate as a realtor or with real estate. What, what would you do with the knowledge that you have today? It's a great question. I know what I would do. I would, <laughs> I would not waste the money on that one year of college that I went to, and I would have taken the college money and invested in real estate. I completely agree with that. At four years of college, so I, I definitely agree with that. And I also had some years of being, uh, you know, having a career not in real estate, so... I definitely think I agree with that. Like sooner, sooner would have been better. Um, if I had more experience now, who knows what that would mean, you know? Yeah. And yeah. I think, you know, knowing what I know now, I'm sure knowing what you know now with different, different mortgage options, different lending options, different realtor options, realtors with different education and niches and expertise in different aspects of flipping and buy and hold and house hacking and things like that. Like you said before, at a young age with little money, you can get started in investing in real estate in some way, shape, and form. It's so true. Like, give me one reason you can't. I mean, if the first seven lenders tell you you can't, the eighth one might tell you you can. Right. You know, and and I agree with you. If I can go back in time, maybe I'd have more uh, knowledge on the financing. I think that's a great, a great answer. However, I'm so happy I, my experience has led me to, to finding that out, you know, that there, there's a lot of value in that because I got, had to go through it. And I remember hearing from the first lender, which I thought was the end all be all that I can't afford this $300,000 condo and that I can only afford whatever it was. And I was just like, nah, I can't like all this bigger pockets I listen to, I can't do it. And then I just said, I just chose not to believe that. (laughs) And again, a few years later, I not only did that, but I bought another home and I kept that one. I didn't have to sell it. So it's just, you you gotta, you gotta know the right people and you gotta, you gotta uh, network and educate yourself. Right. Right. What else? What else? I mean, I could always talk about selling sunset if you want me to. Selling OC is another one. Yeah. Uh, Selling OC. I didn't get too much into that one. No, I think I, I watched the first episode. I really like that one. Yeah. That's, 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 with, their, that's with their new office, right? Yeah, and it has have, a new season coming soon. 
more male realtors than the other office? Yeah, the other one is zero. This one is, yeah. is mixed male and female. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good. It's it's different drama. Okay. Because males are involved, so it becomes like a little. I don't I don't want to give away the you know the amazing show, but you got you got to just watch it. Maybe we'll have another episode and just break yeah. it down. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, anything else you want to talk about? Anything else you want to go over? Not in particular. Um, I love talking real estate. So I love that you asked me to come on the show and talk real estate. Uh, my favorite two things to talk about are real estate and baseball. So, you know, I know we said Selling Sunset should be its own episode, but I don't really believe that. I don't want to talk about Selling no, Sunset. No. I want to talk about baseball, though, on a new episode. So yeah. no, we'll, we we'll definitely. <laughs> yeah, Tim, Tim's a little tied up tonight, but uh, we'll definitely get the three of us together on an episode yeah. or we'll even have you over to the studio sometime For to sure. do an in-person episode. We'll do uh, baseball. And I know Tim wants to talk about sports analytics. Okay. I mean, I, yeah, I'm not just baseball. I'm a big football, basketball, all of it. Yeah. And, you know, so d tying that into real estate again, I was a coach in baseball and I was always afraid when I took that leap out of coaching that I would lose that love I have. But actually, I have more time to watch the Yankees than I ever have. Yeah. You know, if I'm coaching baseball March through June, I, I can't really watch the Yankees. And yeah. now, I, now I can. So I, it's been great. And I'm building a wiffle ball field in my backyard. Nice. Nice. Oh, yep. I might have to stop by and we'll play some wiffle ball sometime too. Yeah, I'm, try I'm trying to make some very backyard specific rules that are still a work in progress. Okay. Thinking one of them, if you if you hit a foul ball into the neighbor's yard, inning over. Don't do that. You hit. Don't do that. Inning over. You got to be penalized for that. You got to jump over the fence. You know, it's uh -huh. no one wants that. So nice. that's, that's one rule I got in mind. Nice. <laughs> can you can you throw a wicked curve with the wiffle ball? So I'm personally not very good at that, but I know some people that really are, and we're have we're having discussions. Me and the committee here of possibly having this wiffle ball field in the league that we're going to have be underhand pitching only. So it's not really pitcher. Uh, <clears throat> so there's no strikeouts. Like the, the point is ball in play, you know, pace of play, a lot of action more so than like a walk and a strikeout and a nasty curve that no one could hit. Right. You know, so it's going to be a little different here. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. So you're going to be a home run fence. Yeah, we got um, we got a warning track of rocks, and then we got the home okay. run fence. So I had landscapers helping uh, a few weeks ago, and it looks really nice. Nice, so that's awesome. Yeah, and real estate being in real estate helped me get this backyard, so yeah. I, I can play more baseball. Like I'm you a can, kid. you can get a couple of you could probably get a couple of realtors to help sponsor and pay for the backyard wiffle ball field by offering like some banners on the fence. Yeah, well, the strike zone is going to be my for sale sign. Okay, nice. and that that's um the that's for my, sale my sign that you currently are brokered by or a previous brokerage. <laughs> currently, actually. Oh, okay. It's, right. Yeah, it's not meant to be like toilet paper. It's <laughs> okay. Because yeah. I've got a bunch of signs that are basically as good as toilet paper at this point. Right. But... Yeah. Same with business cards and stuff. Yeah. Yep. That's part of the the learning curves, you know. Yeah. Yep. That too. And I, you know, I would just say to any real estate agents that might be watching, you know, don't be afraid to make a change, you know, and I'm not going to sit here and pitch a specific brokerage. You have to find what education model, what training model, what, what support model, what collaboration model, what's going to work best for you and your personality, your business style. Where do you want your business to be tomorrow and 10 years from now? And if where you're at is not right, it's just a matter of paperwork and, and maybe some fees here and there to switch to a real estate brokerage where you can see a better future or help make a better future for yourself and other people. So I know it took me a long time to make a tough decision. And after I made that decision, it was exactly what I just said, a matter of paperwork and a matter of hours before I felt better about myself and I felt better about my real estate career. Well said, me too, me too. And you know, it's, it's just so important to surround yourself with people who care about your growth. And you know, 
it's not in every model that that is inherently caring for each agent. So it's really important to do your homework and also know that, I mean, I, you just said this, but it is a matter of, like you could leave any situation. That's the power of being an independent broker. You're not tied down. I mean, I, sometimes people sign contracts, <clears throat> which I would recommend never doing uh, with a brokerage, <clears throat> excuse me, but you're so right. It's, it's just, you're an independent contractor. Do what's best for you. Don't let someone else tell you what's best for you. Yep, absolutely. And even even within that independent contractor's agreement, you might have a logo on your chest or a logo on your business card, but you are still your own business. You know, as long as you haven't signed any other crazy agreements or any limitations to yourself or your business or anything like that. But you can pretty much do whatever you want as a business person within the stipulations of your state's real estate commission and laws and rules and regs and all that stuff. But, you know, I, I've told a lot of real estate agents as I'm teaching and training and mentoring people, like the sky is the limit. Your real estate business can be whatever you want it to be. If you want to be part time and do one or two deals a year and just make some extra cash, that's great. I'll teach you how to do that and I'll help you how to do that. If you want to do 100 deals a year, good for you. Congratulations. I don't know how the hell you're going to do it, but let's figure it out. Mm -hmm. You know, let's figure it out together. Let's get one deal. Let's get five deals. Let's get 10. Let's get 20. Let's get 50 and just figure it out along the way. But you can really do anything in, in this career. Yeah. And I, I have an analogy I just thought of. So, John, let me ask you, name a famous racehorse. Famous racehorse, um, the one that starts with an S that I can't think of. Sea Biscuit. There you go. Sure. Sea Biscuit is a movie. Maybe Secretariat. Maybe you're thinking. Of I that think one. I was thinking of Secretariat. Uh, yeah. Go with Secretariat. One Triple Crown. Do you know Secretariat? So you knew Secretariat. You knew the S, but you you've heard of Secretariat, a horse that existed in the '60s. Do you know Secretariat's jockey's name? Absolutely not. Correct. So. My analogy is the agent, you're the racehorse, right? No one's going to remember, honestly, no one's going to remember what brokerage you're with because that's the jockey. And the jockey can help you get somewhere. It, it, you know, jockey could definitely lose a race for you if they don't know what they're doing. And a jockey can also help you win the race. That's what a good jockey does. But the racehorse is, you know, is, is what gets remembered. Wow. I like that. Like that? I just thought yep. of it literally while you were talking. That's a good one. <laughs> I, wish I, knew, good one. I wish I knew uh, Secretariat's jockey's name. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing it was probably a short guy. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> All right, Jake. Well, I appreciate your time. Appreciate you coming on the podcast. Um, any Anything you want to wrap up with? Yes, I will be back. Definitely. Definitely. Thanks so much. Awesome. Enjoyed yep. it. Thanks. Take Jake. care. Bye.